Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is John Elmore. I serve here on the Dallas campus in both community and regeneration. Love being here with you. And this week we are continuing the How He Built This series in two ways, in part, how he built this, both with authenticity and repentance. Authenticity, letting what is be known, and repentance, turning from sin by turning towards Christ. Authenticity and repentance. As we talk about authenticity, you might think about a dollar bill or a currency. There are distinguishing marks of authenticity on every single piece of currency. It's how you know that it actually is, that it's not fraudulent, it's not a fake, but that it is true in reality. As you look at it closely, hold it up to the light, you'll see those distinguishing marks of authenticity. If you take a piece of fine china and flip it over to the backside, you will see distinguishing marks of authenticity to know that it is what it is. If you flipped me over to my backside, you would see a distinguishing mark of authenticity. Because one time on 6th Street in Austin, Texas, I thought it would be a great idea to get a tattoo. Now if you're like, what kind of tattoo does a pastor get on his rear end? Let me tell you, that's a great question. You get a cat paw. A cat paw, right? It's okay, you can laugh. Because that's a great idea. Tattoos are permanent, if you didn't realize that. So I have a cat paw on my backside. How's that for authenticity? <laughs> that uh, has stayed with me for the last 13 years. Did I mention I'm a recovering alcoholic? That wasn't a one-off bad decision. I made millions of bad decisions in that period of alcoholism. But the reason why we say how he built this, and I don't mean this structure or building, but this body of Christ, this body of believers, this kingdom advancing, is by some of what I just shared, is authenticity, letting sin be known, and then turning from it. This is seen in Proverbs 28, 13. It says, whoever conceals his sin will not prosper. If you hide your sin, you won't advance, you won't progress, it will hinder you, it will harm you, it will ensnare you, but God doesn't leave us there. He says, whoever confesses authenticity, bringing it into the light, and renounces repentance, there is authenticity and repentance. Whoever confesses and renounces finds mercy, finds healing, finds growth, and moves along in the full abundant life that God has given us. And so that is how he has built this, is through authenticity and repentance. Now I wanna tell you something today. I wanna give you a little bit of a secret that God used in my life to free me from 12 years of alcoholism. From 18 to 30, I was an alcoholic. And I wanna tell you today what he used to free me not because I wanna teach you how to be free from alcohol, but because every single person in this room has some struggle with sin. We all wrestle with sin in various ways and God has made a way for the sea to part and you to walk in freedom. We're gonna unpack that today with authenticity and repentance. So as I said, with the alcoholism. I began binge drinking in junior high whenever me and my friends could find alcohol available. That progressed to more frequently in high school as we got some liberties and transportation. And then by college, I was drinking almost on a daily basis. By the time I graduated school, I walked the stage half drunk from the night before. And then in my years after, in my 20s, down in Austin, Texas, I was drinking daily, multiple times a day, frankly but I was what I would call a functional alcoholic. Like, oh, congrats, you can keep a job, but you're still an alcoholic. Like, you don't deserve a pat on the back. But I progressed in this alcoholism and got darker and darker and deeper and deeper. But I didn't know because in my mind, I like had a good job and I was holding things together, even though that addiction was getting deeper and deeper and I was not living in authenticity or repentance, far from the Lord. I remember I was on a trip to Manhattan with my college buddies and we're all, you know, having a good time, or what we thought was a good time. And the morning after we're sitting there having breakfast and as I'm drinking my beer, Bloody Mary or whatever it was, one of my drinking buddies turns to me and he's like, hey, uh, have you ever considered that you might have a drinking problem? And I'm like, what are you talking about? You were there last night. You were with me. You bought a round. Like, I have a drinking problem? What about you? And just like flipped the script on him. And he's like, yeah, but it's 9 a.m. And here you are drinking again. I used to drink scotch out of a black coffee mug. I had a black coffee mug because you couldn't tell if it wasn't coffee when I would drink from it in the morning to keep the hangover at bay and to keep the buzz going from the night before that it would just progress on. One New Year's Eve, uh, walking around with a glass of scotch in my hand, bought a car, and then woke up the next morning and was like, oh, I don't even like Azuzu's. 
Like, what am I doing? I would drink a fifth of scotch in a night and then drive home. I had three doctors, three doctors tell me, if you keep drinking like this, you're gonna die. And at that point in my life, having squandered and lost just about everything, I was living on a couch, I was like, great, I hope I die. I would take sleeping pills, NyQuil, while I was drinking, hoping that I just wouldn't wake up because I didn't want to live anymore. I was like a dog chasing my tail and I was done. I was depressed, anxious, manic, I'd gone crazy, and I frankly wanted to die. And then my family caught wind of this, and so that my brother flew down to Austin, one-way flight, put me in my own car, drove me back to Dallas, and my family was like, hey, you're hurting yourself and you're hurting us, and so this isn't gonna go on anymore. You're either going to rehab or you're staying here with us, but you're not going back. And I reasoned with them, hey, look, I'll go to AA, just get off my back. Like, fine. I don't even know what AA was, nor did I think I was an alcoholic. I was like, I'll go to AA, just let me alone. And so I would go back to Austin and still didn't think I was an alcoholic. Now, if your drinking friends tell you you're an alcoholic, your doctors tell you you're dying and your family's doing interventions, like you may tap the brakes and realize you might have a problem. I didn't. Instead, I Googled, how do you know you're an alcoholic? And uh, (laughs) it's like, well, if all those people glaringly tell you, you are. And I took this little online assessment, it's AA's 12 questions, and I, I, uh, there's 12 yes or no questions, it takes two minutes, click submit, Whew. I aced the test. But it's the kind of test you don't want to ace. Two hours later, I was in an AA meeting. I was like, all right, finally, like I walk in to that AA meeting, and I remember I'm sitting there, it was like worst first day of kindergarten ever. I mean, not the kind of place you want to be. I would squandered everything God had given me in my life. And here I am walking into an AA meeting at the age of 30. And I remember thinking like, what have I done to get to this point? And I'm sitting there and I'm looking around at this meeting and I'm hearing people talk about their old drinking stories and the pain that it caused. I'm like, what good is this going to do me? Everything in me just wanted to go get drunk. Like, man, I I just want to go get numb. Like, I can make all this go away. And frankly, this isn't going to help. What, sit around and hear people talk about how bad drinking was? It makes me want to drink more. But then someone posed a question. The moderator said this, and time stopped. Is there anyone here that would like to commit to staying sober for the next 24 hours? And I mean, it's like everything was just pointed to me And it was as if, I mean, it's probably the Holy Spirit, was pushing me out of my seat, like walk forward. And so heart pounding through my chest, I walk up in this room full of strangers, so embarrassed, so humiliated, that I'm even in this meeting and now I'm walking forward and I'm like, I'm gonna commit to staying sober for the next 24 hours. And so I receive this, I get this 24 hour chip. It's the only thing I've ever kept on my key ring since. You can see a picture of it there on the screen in case you've never seen one. It's a commitment to staying sober for 24 hours. And that's how I got the chip. I go back to my seat. But I'm still sitting there and I'm like, man, how's this gonna help? I've been drinking for 12 years. Like I need serious, serious help. 24 hours, like that, is that really gonna do me any good? And right about then the meeting breaks and here comes the big Lebowski. I mean, he's got goatee, tough but chill dude from Austin. He's like, so you want to do this thing? You're going to need some help. I was like, oh great. Of all the people to give me help, it's you, Charlie P down in Austin, Texas. And he says, hey, will you commit to staying sober for the next 24 hours? And I'm like, oh man, have you even been listening? Have you been drinking? That's what he just asked me. And he goes, but by God's strength. I was like, Okay, sure. He's like, well, I want you to go pray then. I want you to go pray and ask God to keep you sober. And then he said this. And what time is it, six o'clock? I want you to follow up with me tomorrow at 6 p.m. and let me know how you did. Now, Charlie just raised the stakes in two different ways. It wasn't just now my own strength to keep me sober, like my own decision of like, fine, I'll stay sober for 24 hours. It was like, hey, will you do it by God's strength? Will you ask him to help you stay sober for 24 hours and... I want you to call me tomorrow and let me know if you did. I'd never had that kind of accountability in my life. And so as I leave that meeting, I start getting phone calls and texts. Hey, we're at Fado down on 4th Street. Come join us. Come on, usual. Let's go have some pints and drinks. And, and I was like, God, you got to keep me sober. You got to keep me sober. 
And I knew in the back of my mind, I gotta call, that, I gotta call the Big Lebowski tomorrow. I gotta call Charlie at 6 p.m. And he's gonna ask me whether or not I have stayed sober. And so those two things in tandem, both God's power and community in my life to help me, were working together to give me strength to stay sober for that 24 hours. But here's the thing. I call him the next day. He's like, did you stay sober for 24 hours? And I was like, yeah, Charlie, stay sober for 24 hours. But hey, but let, let me tell you, I need real help. I don't need 24 hours. I've gone a month before, Charlie. When my family and friends said I had a drinking problem, I actually went a month. So I don't need a day. I need like real help for a lifetime. And he's like, yeah, don't, don't worry about that actually. Will you stay sober for another 24 hours? I'm like, Charlie. He's like, by God's strength. Okay, okay, yes. Call me tomorrow. Okay, hey, what are, are we gonna do this the rest of our lives? Like, I need help. And he's like, I didn't realize in that moment, I wanted a lifetime of freedom. And Charlie in that moment was saying, hey, a lifetime of freedom comes one day at a time. There's not some hocus pocus magic moment. You walk the aisle, get knocked over and the demon of drunkenness leaves you. But rather, as you walk one day at a time with your Lord and Savior, he will set you free. The freedom will be found in a daily abiding relationship with your creator. He's the one that'll set you free. And so, yeah, we're gonna do this the rest of our lives is what he was saying to me. This will happen one day at a time as you walk with him. And so what he taught me to do and what I still do to this day, I got on my knees that first day, December 22nd, 2005, I got on my knees. I was like, God, you gotta keep me sober today. By your strength, by your power, keep me sober today. And then I'd call my buddy the next day. Hebrews 3.13 says, encourage one another daily so you're not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We need God daily, we need others daily, our brothers and sisters in Christ. But it wasn't just that because God doesn't just want to set me free from alcoholism or you from porn or control or anxiety or fear, whatever your flavor of sin may be. He's looking to reconcile you to the Father through the Son that you may live this full abundant life. In him we live and move and have our being. See, for all of my life, I just, I believed God existed. Like I could see it, I acknowledge it. There's order instead of non-order. There's, there's life instead of, I, I, I just knew. And then at the age of nine, I heard the gospel for the very first time from Todd Wagner. How ironic is that? My camp counselor at Canacuck was Todd Wagner when I was nine years old. And he shared the gospel with me. He didn't disciple me, so I ended up being an alcoholic, but he did share the gospel. <laughs> it's his fault. It is his fault. No, he only had a week with me and then I went home and, but he shared the gospel with me at that time. He's like, we've been separated by God because of our sin. And so God sent Jesus to live a sinless life that we couldn't live, died on the cross, was buried and raised again that you could be reconciled to the Father if you place your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. You could be made right with God in right relationship with your creator and not just experience not going to hell when you die, but not live in this hell while you live. That he saved you and he will keep you safe. But it didn't click for me. In my childhood, I'm like, I don't wanna go to hell when I die, so okay, Jesus, whatever. And then I thought I just had to follow his rules. For the rest of my life, I just like, well, he busted me out of the jail cell of hell, so now I have to follow all of his rules. Don't drink, smoke, mess around with girls, porn, all that stuff. Like, I'll just, I have to follow his rules. And I always messed up, always. And it was so frustrating to me because I was like, blew it again, Jesus. Blew it again, Jesus. I'll try harder, blew it again, Jesus. I was like, you know what? Forget it. I guess it's not you. I guess it's me. I guess I'm just a colossal screw up. Everybody else seems to be doing fine, but I can't keep your stupid rules. And frankly, your rules keep me from doing everything that I actually want to do. Freedom in Christ, what a joke. It's not freedom. And so I just like jettisoned the whole thing. It was like, I, maybe I won't go to hell when I die, but I'm, I'm going to be Lord of my life. And there in my addiction at the age of 30, realized I am a slave. I am a slave to this thing, alcohol. And not just that, my, my life has imploded upon me. And so there at step three in AA, that says, surrender your life and will over your higher power, whomever you deem him to be. And people are praying the doorknobs, Coke machine, Pacific Ocean, uh, it's more sad than funny. But I remembered 
Todd telling me about Jesus. And I realized for the first time at the age of 30, in my brokenness, in my slavery to sin, you gotta be Lord of my life. I'm a really bad Lord of my life. You can't just be my savior. This isn't a la carte. If I'm gonna trust in you, it's for eternity and for today and every day thereafter. You've got to be my savior and my Lord. And so I surrendered everything to him. I remember kneeling beside the couch that I was living on and I was like, Lord, I've squandered everything you've given me, but whatever I have left, it is yours. You have my life, my mind, my body, my money, my relationships, where I live, what I do, my career, my car, my computer, my phone, it's all yours. Be Lord of my life. And he rescued me. He gave me what the Bible promises, not a better life, a new life. He set me free from slavery to Satan and sin and reconciled me to the Father that I could have this relationship with God. I always felt this like ache in my soul. Alcohol wasn't my problem, it was my solution. But now God, Christ had given me peace that alcohol never could. That was a fleeting poisonous peace and Jesus gave it to me without fail. And he gave me a new life, born again, that I could walk with my God for the rest of my life. But I was still an addict, 13 and a half years sober, and yet just a year ago, I had this other addiction. I had this other addiction that I was struggling with, and it was arguing with my wife. See, we had... Well, we still have small kids. They're five, three, and one right now, so they were less than that, which means the pressure was even higher a year ago. They weren't sleeping. They can't feed themselves, dress themselves. They go to the bathroom in their pants. They don't speak English. It's like the pressure is relentless. And so we were just at each other. We had such a short flashpoint, like any little thing would tip us over, and we'd be in a, we'd be in a fight you know, a little over a year ago. And we were on this date night. We take a weekly date night. We find that that's more affordable and more fun than marriage counseling. And so we take a weekly date night. And uh, when I say date night, uh, I'm no slouch. We go big. So I took her to Chili's. <laughs> and we split a meal. They have a $10 special. And so there we are on our date night. We're driving. We're about a block away from the house. We hadn't even made it to the first stoplight. I can see in our mind there are Campbell and Waterview, and we're already fighting, not a block from the house. And she says, she says this, she looks at me, or she, I don't even think she looked at me, I think she was just looking in defeat out the windshield and was like, I just wish for the rest of our lives we wouldn't fight anymore. And I said, yeah, well, good luck with that because you're in this marriage, so that's not gonna happen. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I thought it, I didn't say it. <laughs> but I did think it, but I didn't say it. I do still have a remaining filter. You think like I don't because of my tattoo story, but I do, there's a little bit of a filter. And, uh, but I had another thought in that moment. The other thought that I had was, hey, God saved you from alcoholism. He saved you from the addiction to alcohol. He could probably set you free from arguing with your wife. It's a court of three strands and dwelt by the spirit, one flesh, his daughter, my sister in Christ and bride. He could probably keep you from arguing with your wife one day at a time, just like he kept you from drinking one day at a time. I think if I brought God into the fight, he could probably keep us from fighting. And so I didn't even tell her what I was doing, but I purposed that day, every single day, whereas before I was getting on my knees and asking him to keep me sober from alcohol or just surrendering my day to him. Now I'm like, God, this is your day. And specifically started to make war against that sin and bringing God into the fight. Like, Lord, I don't wanna fight with Laura anymore. I don't want to love her. You love her. So keep us from fighting. And so what happened is, is that anytime there started to be a little bit of a t tension, I, I imagine like a tug of war where we're trying to win the argument. You'd rather be right than have a right relationship. I'm pulling on this. I want to be right. And as soon as I would feel that tension as we would have what would normally become this explosive fight, I just drop the rope. Proverbs says, drop the quarrel before it breaks out. And so that was the verse the Lord gave me in that time as I was surrendering to him one day and being like, I don't wanna fight with my bride anymore. And I'd start to feel that tension, I'd just drop it. And I'd move towards her and be like, I love you. 
Like, let's not do this. And, and here's the thing, after like six months, she was like, hey, do you, do you realize we're not fighting anymore? I was like, yes. <laughs> because she wasn't doing anything other than normal life. I was the only one that was actually trying to stop fighting, which put all the blame squarely on me. Great. Like if I would just change, then we wouldn't fight. Like that was pretty terrible. And so over the course of a one year time, truly, I think we fought three times, three times in one year. If you're single, you're like, <laughs> see, didn't work. If you're married, you know, that's a miracle. <laughs> you're like, what? How? Because God, because God parts the seas still and you can walk through on dry ground and he swallows up your enemies. That's what he does. There's victory over sin, but we've got to bring him into the fight. We've got to ask him to go to war against our sin. It says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you do what your flesh wants to do, if you want to be right in every argument, if you want to give yourself over to lust or the flesh of drinking or porn or same-sex attraction or whatever, like if, or food binging or lack thereof because you're so concerned about your body image, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It will lead to death, but if by the spirit, you put to death the deeds of the flesh. By God's power, you put them to death. You will live. You will live. And so he sets us free. He sets us free. I want to show you this principle and give you a little bit of a visual. So uh, Laura is a stay-at-home mom, and so she works a lot harder than I do right now. And hats off to moms and single moms. You all are incredible, like ridiculous. I like have the kids for four hours and I'm like at a breaking point being sharp and biting and all the fruit of the spirit is out the window. And I'm like, I, I've come apart at the seams. I'm getting owned by a five, three and one year old. So I, I, I'm, we're there one Saturday and I can see my wife. She's been with them all week. And I was like, Hey, let me, let me take the kids. You're going to get a break, which a break for a mom is really just you get to fold laundry and do dishes in silence rather than with the kids screaming. So uh, I take the kids and she's still actually working, but I take them to the grocery store. I've got a one-year-old strapped on, the other two in the cart. And she says, hey, at the grocery store, here's what we need. Pum it was October. Pumpkins, chapstick, milk, almond milk, cereal, bananas, something else. It was eight items. I was like, got it. I'm on it. So we go to the grocery store. Here's our grocery cart 30 minutes later. And she gets home and she's like, what happened? And I'm like, you know what happened? They're relentless. They're at me like, hey, how about the Twizzlers? What about the candy corn? What about the, and so I don't, I don't know what happened, but I got your eight items. She's like, yeah, you got the eight items and you got 80 more after that. And I'm like, I don't, hey, here's the kids. I'm going to go take a nap. Like, uh, one or two didn't. So that's what happens in our spiritual life. It's the same thing. Is we say, well, hey, God, I'll tell you what, I'll get your eight items, I'll get your quiet time, I'll get my prayer, I'll get the word, I'll get my community, I'll get those things, but because we don't purpose to not get other things, other stuff ends up in our life that we never wanted there, it's just junk and trash. If I would have committed to Laura in advance, I promise you, I will only get those eight things. I would have gotten those only, the eight things. It wouldn't have been, the, the temptation would have been out. I would have told the kids, sorry, we're only getting eight things. Can we have candy corn? No. Pumpkins. Can we have this? No. Almond milk. Just those eight things. But because we don't proactively do that in our spiritual life, we end up with a bunch of other junk in our basket that we never intended. We have our quiet time and our prayer. And then as we go through the day, we're like, oh, lust, a little bit of pride, a little bit of self-aggrandizing, a little bit of eating disorder, a little bit of body image, a little bit of flirting when I shouldn't. And all this stuff ends up in there because we didn't purpose at the outset, I will not do those things. I will not put those things in my basket. We don't make a proactive decision. We're not going to war against sin. And so it ends up that we pray defense. Defense is to confess sin. We should. We should confess sin and pray for each other. It's why in community we're saying, how have you fed the flesh this week? And then praying for each other and then taking steps of repentance. But there's an offense. We need to go on the offensive with our sin, with God's help, that we would engage in war against our sin by God's power. And the way that we do that is not a reactive confession after we've sinned, but rather a proactive decision that we would proactively say, I'm going to do, by God's power, I'm not going to do X, Y, or Z. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put that in my basket. I have decided today, God, by your power, I'm not gonna drink, 
I'm not gonna touch myself, I'm not gonna look online at that thing, I'm not gonna do that gambling, I'm not gonna take that pill. That proactively, we're gonna make a decision at the outset and make war against sin. Now, lest you think this is some AA thing that I'm trying to syncretize and rip off and just bring into the church, let me tell you about three great theologians who employed this in their lives and called the church to it. We all know about Martin Luther, Martin Luther, the great reformer who set the world on fire by bringing the gospel back into the church, giving the scriptures back to the people. He wrote the 95 Theses, we're familiar with this, nailed it to the church in Wittenberg. But we don't familiarize ourselves with what the thesis actually was. The first four, the first four of Martin Luther's theses were all about repentance, daily repentance. We talked about how he built this as authenticity and repentance. His first four, meaning of utmost priority and urgency, the church must repent. And it's not once and for all. It'll be on the screen. Let's read the first and third thesis. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Yet it does not mean solely inner repentance. Such inner repentance is worthless unless it produces various outward mortifications of the flesh, meaning you start to see sin dying death. You've got to see sin dying. That's the mortification of the flesh by God's power. John Owen, another theologian in the 1600s, he wrote that timeless act, mortification of the flesh. He wrote this, do you mortify, meaning kill sin? Do you make it your daily work? Always be at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. There's no neutral. Sin's either gonna be killing you or you will be killing sin by the power of God, as I said in Romans 8, 13. If by the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. And so there's the mortification of the flesh from John Owen. And here's a third, Jonathan Edwards. These are too many to quote, but Jonathan Edwards has had his grocery list. He had his resolutions, Edwards resolutions. He wrote 70 resolutions of this is what I will do and this is what I will not do for the rest of my life. I will do this, I won't do this. He, like me going to the grocery store, had, or differently, had determined this is going in the basket and this is not. And he read those resolutions every single week to go on the offensive against sin. Because though we have been saved eternally from hell by placing our faith in Jesus, we've got to be kept safe from the hell of sin in this life as we walk with him one day at a time. The resolute, the resolve to be authentic and to repent. That is how he builds this, the body of Christ. The passage that I wanna walk us through as we get to the application of this, as you now think about personally appropriating this truth, is James 4, 7. In James 4, 7, there are two commands and a promise. You're gonna be told to do two things, and then God's gonna give you a promise, a really powerful promise. The two commands, submit, yourselves, therefore to God, resist the devil, and here's the promise, and he will flee from you. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will run from you. And who doesn't want that? To have Satan and his temptations and his trials and everything that he's throwing at you to flee from you, and here's how we do it. To submit ourselves, therefore, to God, I told you that for the last 13 years, I get on my knees. Every single day, I did it today, but I didn't do it today for arguing with my wife. We, st we still have conflict, by the way. It's just not to the degree and frequency that it used to be because we've brought God into that fight of our fighting. Now, what I'm on my knees for every day with my community group, with Mike and Shane, by God's power, is to keep me free from barking and biting and being sharp with my kids. I love my kids, but man, the flesh is at war and I will, I will be short and sharp with them. And so I need to submit, not only in that area, but every area of my life. And so I get on my knees every single morning and submit myself to God. And it's a glad submission. 
As I said earlier, I'm a bad Lord of my life. He's a really good Lord of my life. He gives the full, abundant, easy yoke when I walk with him. And so every morning I'm getting on my knees and that specifically, I'm asking him to go to war on my behalf. We submit ourselves, glad submission, but then also it's got to be to God. We can't do this on our own strength. You have no power. You have no power over sin. The only power that is available to you is the power from the Spirit. He is the sanctifier. 1 Peter 1, 2 says that the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. He is the one that will shape you into the image of the cross, into the image of Christ for the glory of the Father whom you've been adopted by. The Spirit sanctifies, and so you have no power. You've got to submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Ask Him to do the work. He's the one that has the power to fight and war against that sin. You have none on your own. And so every single day, you've got to ask him to do it. And if you fail, you fail forward. As the Proverbs say, the righteous fall seven times, but they rise again. And so you bring God into that fight. And if and when you fall, you call upon God who restores you. Authenticity, bring it into the light and then repent. Turn from sin by turning to God. And then the other command, resist the devil. Satan's gonna lie to you, and he already has. He has you believing that you are in a jail cell, that whatever your sin struggle is, and though Jesus may have set you free from an eternity separated from God in hell, he can't take your salvation, but he wants to take your freedom. He wants you to believe that your sin struggle, it just is what it is. You know, that's just my ditch. You're just kind of an angry person. You just kind of have a short fuse. That's just kind of your controlling, anxious mind. That's my family of origin. We just kind of yelled at each other to resolve things. It's not any, that's just who I am. That's just how I am bent. Man, I just really like women. Like, that's my thing. I just can't help it. I've tried. I've tried to get free from porn and masturbation. I can't. I've tried hard, man, 40 years. I was exposed to that when I was 12. I've tried quitting, I can't. I guess I won't be free until I'm at home with the Lord. Man, this body image thing, has wrecked me since junior high. And here I am at 40, still trying to get the attention of men, even though I'm married, because I want others to give me a second glance, because that will give me some kind of fulfillment. Or I just kind of like binge on food. That's my thing, that's my comfort. That's my, that's my functional savior that I go to in the moment when I'm celebrating or sad. You know what it is. You know that ditch and Satan's saying, that's it. That's just your thing. Like you're never gonna be free. Sure, you're not gonna go to hell when you die, but I will keep you living in that hell right now. You're in my jail cell and I'm not letting you out. That's your sin. That's your ditch. Good luck getting free. He lies to you. He will tell you that. He will embed it in your identity. But friends, it's a three-sided jail cell. And all you need to do is turn around and walk in the freedom that Jesus has given you. Jesus has unlocked the cell to your sin that you would walk in freedom one day at a time. It says, resist the devil and the promise. He will flee from you. He will flee from you if you resist him. The problem is, is we don't resist him. And so he keeps knocking and he keeps coming and he keeps owning us though we are not his to own we've been set free from slavery to sin but if you would resist him you'll walk in freedom the way that I know that is because I started submitting myself to God one day at a time submitting myself to God one day at a time and resisting the devil and I have found that he has fled from me in that area of my life alcoholism for 13 and a half years And it started one day at a time. A penny is the smallest monetary increment. You can't get smaller than that. And so what felt really insignificant when I was talking to Charlie, I'm like, really? A day, 24 hours? This is stupid. How long are we gonna do this? 48 hours? Are you kidding me? A week? A week's nothing. Charlie, I've gone a week before. Oh, you wanna go a month? I've been a month before. I've even done a month, Charlie. I need serious help, Charlie. And he was saying, no, it doesn't happen that way. God doesn't work that way. You come to him for daily bread. One day at a time is how you submit yourself to God. Not once and for all, but once every single day, you live in glad submission to God and you resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
And so what happened is I started doing that. I was just, and then I went a quarter. I went three months without drinking. I hadn't been three months without drinking since high school. I was 30 years old and I was like, oh my goodness, what is God doing? He's setting me free. I want a year and I couldn't believe it that I had been a year. But it wasn't always easy. There, there was this day, I was sitting in Europe in a bar, which is a bad place for an alcoholic, drinking coffee. And I was like, God, you gotta keep me sober. I need your help. It had been about six months at that point in time and he did, he kept me sober. And then there was this one when I had a, a close friend say, hey, look, you went through a hard time. Anybody would have drank the way you drank. You went through a hard time. You can drink now. You're not in a bad place anymore. Have a beer. It's just one beer. Have a beer. And I prayed, God, you got to keep me sober. And he did. And then there was this one on me and Laura's honeymoon. We went to an all-inclusive in Mexico. And there's drinks everywhere. And they're free. At least I'd already bought them. (laughs) So I guess I bought drinks. I just haven't had drinks. But... They're everywhere. And she goes back to the room and I'm like, well, I don't even have to order one. There's all these half drink drinks on the tables. Like I could just grab one of those. God, you gotta keep me sober. You gotta keep me from alcohol and going back to my sin that I don't wanna do. There was this one in Colorado. Everyone left the room, there was wine. And I picked up the glass. I picked up a glass of wine when everyone left the room. And smelled it. God, you got to keep me sober. I don't want to go back to that evil, evil addiction. And he did. And so for the last 4,861 days, he has been setting me free from my addiction that was too powerful for me. And every single hand clap is from my Lord and Savior Jesus who sets the slaves free. And what he did for me, he will do for you. But you know what I don't need? I don't need a bucket. I don't need a bucket of pennies. I don't need 13 and a half years to hang my hat on and be like, look at me, 13 and a half years. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. What will keep me safe is to say, I'm gonna walk with you one day at a time, Lord, one day at a time. Forget 13 and a half years. It doesn't matter if I bark at my kids or I'm short with my wife or give myself over to binging on cereal, which I'm known to do. <laughs> I've got to kill the flesh by the spirit one day at a time. But that is a picture of what he does. He did it for me. He'll do it for you, no matter what the struggle, no matter what the sin, because Jesus came to set the captives free. Now, friends, when you walked in, you received a penny, right? Everybody get a penny? Who's on that penny? The emancipator of the slaves. The one who set the slaves free. The one who wrote into legislation, all men are free. Jesus is the emancipator of the slaves and is written in Romans 6, the emancipation proclamation for the believers. That whoever has trusted in Jesus, their old self that was a slave to sin has been crucified, dead, buried, raised again to walk in newness of life. The slaves are free in Christ. And there's another word written on that penny. Liberty. It is for freedom he has set you free. Jesus came that you might be in right relationship with God and freed from the deadly relationship to sin and Satan. And the third thing written on that penny on the very front is in God we trust. I won't trust in my own strength and my own self-control or lack thereof. I won't trust in my circumstances or my family of origin. I won't trust in how many decades I've been a slave to my sin struggle. I will trust in God who releases the captives. His promises are true and he will do it for you one day at a time as you walk with him. But the other thing is may you never forget that penny's small, but the penny is powerful. The richest man in the world, his wealth is made up of pennies. And so do not despise the day of small beginnings. As the prophet Zechariah says, do not despise the day of small beginnings, but one day at a time, walk with him. And here's how I want you to do that. Is that you would do it in authenticity, in community, 
with each other, just like Charlie did with me, just like Mike and Shane do now, that you, on a daily basis, if you're able, get in whatever position of humility you can. Surrender your day to God one day at a time. You say, I've already surrendered my life to him. Surrender your day to him. And say, Jesus, I know you've saved me. Keep me safe. I wanna walk with you today. And Jesus, make war against this one particular sin. You know what it is. The Spirit's revealing it to you now. Ask him. He will delight to set you free from that struggle. You alone know what that is. Maybe, your commu- maybe you don't. Maybe your community or your spouse or your roommates need to tell you. But they'll say, hey, how about we make war against that? Get on your knees. Say, Lord, keep me free from that one thing today by your strength, by your power. And then you call or text whoever it is that you're in community with, doing community with. And you say, I commit by God's strength to remain free from that thing for the next 24 hours. And I'm gonna call you, I'm gonna follow up with you tomorrow and let you know how I did. And then you guys do it together and you encourage one another. And one singular day at a time, you will see Christ set you free. And when he does, you just start making war against something else. Because those things are warring against us and God has set you free from that cell. You are free. This is how he has built this. Authenticity, bringing things into the light, calling sin what it is, and then repentance. To turn from sin by turning towards Christ in the context of community. And we will see the kingdom advance in your life, in this community, and in this world. It's what Jesus lives to do. Let me pray. Lord, I praise you and thank you for the freedom that you have given us in Christ, for the reconciliation that we have to the Father, that we're no longer slaves to sin, we're no longer dead in our sins. You've made us alive and new in Christ and dwelt by the Spirit. And the cell of our sin has been opened. May we live there in complacency and complicity no longer, but make war by the power of the Spirit, bringing it into the light with authenticity and daily repenting to walk in the freedom that you have bought for us, not by might, nor by power, but by your spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This isn't about pennies, it's not about coins, it's about the power of the spirit setting free his people, and we are free. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Amen.